I mentioned something last week, which is looking at the Gospels and looking actually at the New Testament, but specifically the Gospels, in a way that would be considered more what the Greek calls bi, where we get our term for biography, that is the life, bio, living or life, and graphia, writing. Bioi, plural, of looking at a snippet, if you will, of Jesus' life and his ministry, not an exhaustive start to finish, um, but the most important parts included. And what I came across, I'm always researching and coming across things that I enjoy. This is not uh, reading for, boy, this is not reading for the folks who want to buy the books with the preacher's face on the cover smiling. <laughs> no. But if you're really serious, um, this is kind of an interesting research um, from the Society of Biblical Literature Resources for Biblical Study, edited by David E. Aoun, Greco-Roman Literature and the New Testament. And in this, I will just read you one thing very quickly that he says regarding we tend to not analyze the type of writing. We just read it. We read it, we're familiar with it, we don't, we don't think about analyzing the type of writing. This individual did. Um, this is what he says. He says, ideally, history ought to be truthful, useful, and entertaining. The material for biography was often gotten from historical works, um, but the accent was placed upon the subjects as paradigms of virtue and less frequently of vice. Thus, while biography tended to emphasize the one-sided praise of the subject, it was still firmly rooted in historical fact rather than literary fiction. Thus, while the evangelist clearly had an important theological agenda, the very fact that they chose to adapt, adapt a Greco-Roman biographical convention to tell the story of Jesus indicates that they were centrally concerned to communicate what they thought really happened. Now, this gentleman actually analyzes brilliantly, um, if you're interested in when this was published, just food for thought, 1988. Um, there's a whole analysis of the style of writing, composition. So if we were actually going to investigate, like um, archaeologists do when they are going to dig, they're investigating a certain period or looking for a certain culture, we should also not come into the church and just say, oh, well, it is what it is. Understanding the style of writing becomes very important. Now, that, I just thought I'd mention that because I touched on it last week. And one has to come to the conclusion on your own, when you examine the evidence, that these individuals that are part of the uh, Gospels, and of course, I will include Paul in the New Testament frame, um, were interested in telling some fact about what they perceived, they saw, were witnesses to, or experienced. Most historians would say that this type of writing would not qualify as history, because unless you were an eyewitness to the events, you cannot be telling something, and of course, you end up in the camp of people that say miracles cannot be considered as historical facts because a la David Hume, miracles cannot occur, and anyone who says that they do is lying because miracles don't happen because they can happen. That circular argument that C.S. Lewis talked about, that my late husband often drew a circle and told you about. So I'm not going to try today and analyze the writing, but I am going to just make a few uh, comments here. All of the writing that we read in the New Testament Early Christians claimed Jesus was raised from the dead. Um, they claimed that there, at least in some parts, as you read, there, that there was an empty tomb, that he physically appeared. As Luke uses something in his writing, he says, flesh and bones regarding Jesus. That should dispel immediately those people who say, uh, a la Jesus seminar and funk and those folks that say that these were Christophanies or theophanies or appearances, but they were not bodily. Luke, who is called a physician, I think he would know what flesh and bones looks like. 
So, you know, you've got to enter in and m make some good assessments. Furthermore, if it's just an apparition, a theophany, a Christophany, uh, and not an actual person that resurrected before them, then this theophany or whoever he was that appeared, interestingly enough, it says that he ate and drank with them. And I'd like to know where the food went. <laughs> um, Luke also does something interesting which we tend to overlook, and I'll touch on this today, and if the Lord wills, we'll continue on this subject so that we can really put down a solid foundation. But Luke mentions two situations that are often confused with and lumped into the rest of the appearances, and that is the appearance of Christ that Stephen sees and then later that Paul sees, and we're talking about post-ascension. These are critical for understanding. They're, they should not be homogenized with a mere appearance of the resurrected Christ that Luke catalogs 40 days he appeared on and off to the disciples. But post-ascension, after they stood and they watched him ascend up, if it actually happened, and the uh, remark to those, why stand ye gazing up? What, what, essentially, what are you looking at? What's so, you know, this is part of the whole thing that's supposed to happen. What, what's the big deal here? But these appearances I just mentioned, Stephen and Paul, are post-ascension, which makes them extremely important and quite unique. Um, one of the most common words for resurrection in the Greek, or from the Greek, is the word anastasis. And if you hang around here a little while, I don't say that you must know Greek, but you'll be exposed to some Greek. This word, if you are looking in the Strong's Concordance, which is the tool used for the King James, all the words listed in the King James, if you're using NIV, don't try and use the Strong's. It doesn't work with anything else except for the King James. It is number 386. And let's write this out phonetically for you, anastasis, which is actually a compound from two words in the Greek, ana, which is usually up, and stasis, which is to be raised up again from the dead, resurrection, raised to life. And actually, this stasis is from another Greek word, stemi. I'll just write it in, in English. It looks something like that, stemi, which is to stand. So when we talk about resurrection, it's important to understand what exactly was meant. And we are not to assume, by the way, that it was not understood by the Jewish community. There was no New Testament at the time that Jesus rose from the dead, all right? But what would have been understood in the Jewish community would have been things alluded to, or in some cases perfectly clear, such as texts out of Daniel and Ezekiel, and if we were looking at the intertestamental period, um, the writings that occurred definitely that are contained usually in the Septuagint, we find those writings. Um, we definitely can find clear understanding of resurrection, which is not simply life, death, and raising up, but life after life which can only come by death, which is why several times we read, except something dies, then it can be raised up. Now, Jesus' resurrection, we talk about his bodily resurrection. And the uniqueness of his resurrection versus the resurrection that will happen to people who are in an atom body. And this is also another important distinction. Jesus' body saw no corruption. In, by the way, in fulfillment of the scripture, which I mentioned last week. I don't know about you, but it would be very hard to manipulate so many people into so many thought processes that they, saw, that they thought they saw, or they speculated, or they were encouraged to do or behave a certain way. Like, you remember that, uh, they used to be an illusionist. He used to do that with mass groups of people where he could get people to do, a mass group of people could do something. You remember it was popular in the 70s and the 80s. And uh, maybe Jesus had those powers, but 
What's ridiculous to assume is that he had the power to manipulate what had been penned hundreds of years before he came to be on this earth. How could he manipulate, for example, the place of his birth? You know, if you're going to say, oh yeah, well, he just, he, after the fact, he fulfilled these prophecies. Well, how do you manipulate where you're born when you don't even have access to knowing where you're going to be born? How do you manipulate that? There are certain things that we have to conclude these people writing these events down had to possess a certain amount of knowledge that maybe people would read this and say, what? That's not possible. But yet, he is indeed fulfilling the scriptures. So when we talk about being raised from the dead, the uniqueness of Christ is that as he appeared, he appeared with a body. He did not appear as some ghost-like image. In fact, Luke goes to great trouble. There are some wonderful details in Luke's writing, goes to great trouble to talk about how the grave clothes were still in the grave. And when we talk about you know, how somebody would be wrapped up and prepared for death, those grave clothes should have been much like Lazarus. Lazarus, when he came out, he must have still been bound up. I don't think he just magically broke out of the clothes he was wrapped in for his burial. So when we talk about Christ being the first goer, the first fruit, remember his body saw no decay. Our bodies will decay. We know Medically and factually, bodies, indeed, once death occurs, decay of the skin, of whatever's left on you, that's what happens. So we have to be clear about the resurrection, the specific resurrection of Christ, not an appearance, body, eating, drinking, um, grave clothes are in the grave, he's not still wearing them, walking around like a mummy. And um, in our case, when we look to resurrection, Paul explains in great detail what it should mean for us as there is a body that is given to us on earth. There is also a celestial body. And we talk about the dead in Christ being raised up. Just know that there are certain, th certain elements to that that people tend to caricature, which if time permitted, I would elaborate on. But I'm just trying to touch the surface of all these to get to where I want to go. So the first word I looked at, anastasis. The second word from the Greek is, and I'll go to the root. It's probably easier to, to write the root of it. Um, it gero, gero is to awake or to raise, to be raised. Um, resurgence. This, if you're looking, would be related to Strong's 1453 and 54. And then ultimately, one last word, which is actually a compound attached to this word. So really, we're only dealing with two words. But when you have X like this placed in front of anastasis, X is out of and above, which is essentially unequivocally rising from death, being used exclusively for that. So when we look at these words, it is important. It's not just enough to say, oh, we describe resurrection, and then sometimes it gets convoluted because people like to talk about resurrection, and they confuse resurrection. We're looking at Christ as a first goer, a type, prototype, versus what will happen to us. Now, I know that death is not a popular subject. It's certainly not going to make the masses bust down this door because people go across the street in great sorrow visiting their loved ones. But what it should do for the Christian, and this is what I've been saying for many, many years. If a person takes the time to study the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and all that he says about trusting and believing and faithing in him and what we are to anticipate, then it's very clear that we're not amassing all of this knowledge in what I call the boot camp of life down here to just simply be put in a grave and shut down. If that's all there is, then this whole thing called Christianity is nuts, and we're all wasting our time. And as Paul said, if Christ is not risen, our faith is in vain. But we know, if you're going to examine the facts, there are certain facts regarding the resurrection and the people that he appeared to, that if, if you and I were writing, we would not include them. 
we would not include them because they make no sense to include them. So I'd like to look at at least a few of those to lay down something that I think will make a lot of sense once I'm done. If you would open your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians 15. I want to read one verse, and then we're going to go somewhere else so you can, especially for those people who are just kind of navigating their Bible, you at home, I know you've got a Bible tucked away on a shelf somewhere. Go get it. <laughs> you won't embarrass me at all. It will take a second for you to dump your trip over your coffee cup and your pets that are in the way. Go get your Bible. <laughs> We're thinking of you too, by the way, you at home. All right, 1 Corinthians 15 is... This is probably the greatest witness, if you will. Paul, which we'll talk about shortly, is writing to the Corinthians, and he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. And he goes on to chronicle and talk about this. He says, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, there's the death, that he was buried, very important, so when people say that Paul doesn't talk about the empty tomb, nobody mentions his burial, so we don't have to conclude that he didn't think that he just died and he was left out like a Jesus a seminar. People say that he was left out on a pile to be eaten, pecked away at by birds and wild animals. Buried, that is the preaching of the first century, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, that he was seen of Cephas, which is Peter, then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain under this present, but some are fallen asleep, some are already dead. Here's the key thing I want to talk about. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. This is what is perplexing. If you're going to write a story, you would, and if you were going to use people to say who he appeared to, probably the last person you would use is James. And I don't mean that because I have some issue with James in his writing. I've already said my piece about that. Um, Martin Luther called James' epistle a straw-y little epistle with very little gospel in it. But let me tell you some oddities about why would you mention James, who would not be a good witness, who is not a good person. If you're going to talk about people who saw the risen Lord, mentioning James is really kind of not good. And I'll tell you why. If you turn to Mark's gospel, and if you don't want to turn, I'll just read to you. But in, in the third chapter of Mark's gospel, we have um, the scribes basically accusing Jesus of casting out devils by the power of Beelzebub. And Jesus replies to them. And then in that next scene, which is in verse 31, so Mark 3 and 31, it says there, then there came then his brethren and his mother, standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. In another place it says they sought to put him away. They thought he was mad. And he answers and says, Who is my mother and my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat about him. He said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. He's pointing at the people in front of him, not the people that are standing there. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother, my sister, and mother. So it's really important to see that we know unequivocally James was not a follower of Christ during his earthly ministry. And in fact, a careful reading of John 7, something that I, I read over many times, and I confess to you I had not seen this reading because of, we're so familiar, in John 7, there's something that happens with the brothers of Jesus. You know, we tend to read brethren. We automatically jump to this must be those people around Jesus, and we don't think brethren as in brothers. But in John 7, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand, his brethren, his brothers. 
not his brethren, the rest of the people, because they're going to say, his brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. And we're talking about this is his family. Be careful when we read. A lot of times brethren is a homogenized group of people. They're saying essentially in a very taunting way, go and show your disciples, your followers, whatever you're doing. You know, in, in a way that is very suggestive. Now, if, you, if it's not enough, we know that Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was given the announcement that she would have this child and all of the things that we read, born of a virgin, all this staggering stuff. We know that she was present during his first miracle at the marriage in Cana where the water is turned to wine. She, it's at her behest, essentially, and I can just imagine the scene there. We have the King James English, which is very proper. I don't know what he said to his mother, okay? But I'm sure it wasn't honor thy mother with his response. It seemed very harsh. What, if I, what have I to do with the woman? What, why are you wanting me to do this thing at this time? But she's there. She's there intermittently, but by and large, except for her presence, all we read about is that his brothers, and I'm now specifically going after James, was not with him. So very clear is that at the close of John's gospel, when it is the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, standing at the distance while Christ is being crucified and Jesus essentially commits to John the care of his mother. Behold thy mother. Essentially go take care of her. Now if the brothers were present, he would have said, James, you go take care of mom, right? But he says, John, you go take care of, behold, you, that's, that's now your responsibility. So we know that the brothers were not around. Now, if you're going to write a story and chronicle an eyewitness to whom Jesus appeared, the resurrected Christ, that's a, a screaming oddity. Why James? Now, this is what's crazy. You read in Acts. These are all passages we're so familiar with, so just indulge me. Read in Acts, in the first chapter of Acts, and I've said oftentimes if we didn't have the book of Acts, we'd be lost because Acts is a bridge between the Gospels and the Epistles. How do you get to understand what's in the Epistles if you don't have the bridge explaining the events that took us there? So here, in Acts 1, and let me read here, beginning at verse, I'm looking at verse 14, but verse 13. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, where abode both Peter and James and John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brethren. All of a sudden, after, post-resurrection, the brothers are in the upper room. Something would have to change your mindset from wanting to put your brother away, thinking he's a madman, or taunting him, to being in that upper room all of a sudden and waiting there as they were told to do for the endowment of the power from on high. I think that is really stunning. But what's even more stunning is something about James that if you begin to consider the rest of the people who followed Christ, the inner circle, those who he called, save Judas, we know his fate, but those who he called, they were given the great commission. Go out into all the world, making disciples, learners, teaching and preaching whatsoever I've commanded you. Lo, I'm with you always until the end of the earth, right? So what is the oddity? James never leaves Jerusalem. That's the oddity. Now, it's strange because if we go through the history of the church, ultimately the history of the church will kind of pick itself up and essentially you've got to thank the Catholics for this. They actually start a very good chronicle. They start with Peter being the first pope, first bishop and or pope of the church, but they have a very excellent chronicle of the church in Rome. 
versus the Church of Jerusalem, which we know absolutely and unequivocally that at 70 AD is a turning point, the churches, the, the synagogue, the temple, the epicenter of worship in Jerusalem is destroyed. So all of these events that I'm talking about must happen before then, including James, his fate. Now, there are several different historical records, depending on who you read. Um, most people like to read Josephus and think that Josephus is a very good source, um, considering all of the history, the antiquities of the Jews, all the things that he wrote. And yes, much of his history is very good. The only problem that I have in using that as a historical source is it appears to me, as I've studied Josephus' writing, that there are many parts that seem to be, we'll call them glosses, where at a later time, somebody who had a Christian agenda may have gone in and made a few adjustments or tweaks, if you know what I mean. But Josephus talks about the fate of James. Um, Clement of Alexandria, Eusebius, there are other historians that chronicle. Here's what's interesting. He never leaves Jerusalem, unlike the rest of the disciples. And he suffers a fate. If you kind of homogenize all the records, he is essentially thrown off the pinnacle of the temple, and then he's beaten to death with, they said it's one blow to the head, but a, uh, a club. Some records say that he was stoned. But in any event, he, that was the fate that he met. So two things come to mind. One, that the chronicle we know of Paul writing in his writing in 1 Corinthians 15, saying, and then he appeared to James. See, Paul has no dog in the fight. There's no reason. All the other disciples have a reason to fabricate and make up a story here, but Paul doesn't have any reason to record this other than he saw, he heard, he knew. And why do we know that he saw, he heard, he knew? Because in Acts 15, this great meeting occurs, and I say great meeting, I'm kind of saying it in a very interesting way, uh, between James, Peter, um, and we have Paul even chronicled in there, and there is this dynamic. We see that James would like to adhere to the Judaic laws. He's really going to stay put on that. This is why we know just from that incident in Acts 15 that James did not in his lifetime follow Jesus during his earthly ministry. Why? Because Jesus said many things regarding the law. He said, think not I'm come to destroy the law, I'm come to fulfill it. Anybody that had access to Christ and to Christ's teaching would not have remained in that groove, what I'd call the deep groove that the culture prior to what we call the New Testament knew of Judaism. So there are some very interesting dynamics there. Why record James, and we're gonna call him the oddest witness, as someone who saw that Christ appeared to him. Now we don't, we don't know anything except what is written for us. So in Galatians, Paul even chronicles this. And I love that you can go to each one of these. Now, many people will say, well, you know, the, the um, synoptics, you know, we're not sure what we should read and trust. Well, again, you'd have no reason to dispute what Paul is writing. And Paul goes on to chronicle in Galatians 1:19. Obviously, you know that Paul saw James. Uh, he says in verse 18, After three years he went up to Jerusalem to see Peter abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw and unsaved James, the Lord's brother. And then he goes on, a little bit further on in the second chapter, to talk about another, um, I think it's verse 9, when he says, When James Cephas, who is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. When they knew that we were really for real, they extended the love of the brethren to us as well. So it can't be that this is just woven in just for fun. But James makes the worst person to reference. In fact, I said last week, the oddity of what's chronicled in 1 Corinthians 15 is the absence of the appearance to the women because 
we know the women were at the tomb first. Now, I say very delicately and with trepidation, because I seldom, I don't like to give opinions. I like to stick to what's in this book. But I suspect that perhaps, I wouldn't say that Paul wasn't aware that the women were the first at the tomb. I wouldn't say that at all. But what I would say is that perhaps from Paul's vantage point in his address, knowing the social standing of women in that day to even include them would, would bring ridicule and in fact would bring an element of how could you even consider this credible information because women did not have a place as witnesses, let alone in society. So there's kind of some interesting elements, as I said, about how Paul in his 1 Corinthians 15 discourse is cataloging people. The next that I want to talk about is that group of people. He says to above 500 people at once. He says some are alive and some are asleep. Some are still living and some are dead. Let's do a little math here. Let's say absolutely, because there's much debate as to the dating of these books in the Bible, uh, New Testament specifically. But let's say one thing unequivocally. The only writing that is dated after 70 AD, we know absolutely would be John. Why? Because John is the only one that did not die a martyr's death. We have his chronicle picked up by the church fathers, Polycarp specifically, who was an eyewitness to John, who was an eyewitness to Christ. We've got many other good eyewitness to eyewitness testimonies in documentation. So we can put John's death very, very close to the late 90s, no more than 100 AD. Apart from that, the rest of this writing, the bulk of this writing, has to occur before 70 AD. And I say has to. There's been much debate, even the debate of when Paul's writing actually occurred. Some have said that his writing actually occurred before not circulated, occurred before the circulation of the Gospels. There's a lot of speculation there. But the one thing we know unequivocally is that had there been an event that occurred in Jerusalem coinciding sometime after 70, it would have been said somewhere that the new headquarters, folks, if you want to find us, the new headquarters is in XYZ, right? Because the office is now moved, right? <laughs> so um, that's an important thing right there to those 500, and that's what I'm, I'm, I'm reaching for. Even if you date 1 Corinthians 15 to, or the 1 Corinthians letter to, and there are many different scholars' views on this, but even if you put it at the earliest date or even swing it to the latest pendulum, some put it in, in the 50s, I don't think so. But if it, if it was done in the late 50s, even in the early 60s, Here's the issue that I have. If, let's just take this whole group of people right here, and I were to see you saying, I don't see you again for 10 years or five, let's say 10 years, let's call it a good solid 10 years, and I ask you what happened today, 10 years from now, well, you might say you were in the church, and then there'll be varying accounts of what happened. But if I said, the people that are here today, most of them are still alive, so you can go ask them for yourselves what actually happened on this day. Would you really run the risk of saying most of these are still alive? Because that would open up the door that if this is just a mere fabrication, you open yourself up to the real possibility of somebody coming forward and saying, didn't happen like that, absolutely didn't happen, Jesus didn't appear to us. In fact, we were waiting for him and he never showed up. You open yourself up to that possibility. But if the event actually happened, this is what looking at the internal evidence that really suggests these people are chronicling the truth as they perceive it happened, as they see, we're going to call it history for this conversation, Jesus resurrected and appearing to them. I wouldn't run the risk. I might run the risk of pulling one of you aside and saying, okay, now look, let's just keep it between ourselves. Let's make up the story. It's just you and me now. Okay, it's just we three, husband and wife. I can't separate you. It's just, just us together. But trying to ask the whole room to participate, it's not going to fly. 500 people that I could actually go and ask, did you really see Jesus? That's a risk. So there's that element which I always like to throw in. But then there's something else. In Matthew's Gospel, 
after Jesus appeared. In Matthew's Gospel, I believe it's the 28th chapter. Let's see if I'm right. Sometimes the brain works good and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> All right, so 28. Let's see if we got this down pat here. Yep, 28, beginning at verse 16. Then 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Here's the oddity, but some doubted. Now, if you're writing a story and you're inventing your hero to be a resurrected guy, which I'll get to in a minute, you probably wouldn't add this, but some doubted. You'd say, unequivocally, we were all positive. We, we got our story straight. We're all certain. But some doubted. And let's talk about the some that doubted. We don't know who is being referred to here, but we know certainly that Thomas, who wasn't present all the time, because the first time Jesus appeared, there's no mention of Thomas, but the second time and the third time, and Thomas says, well, I won't believe it until I can put my finger into the nail-pierced part, which is kind of gross, by the way. But think about that. He would not believe until, and Christ basically subjected himself to the test. Go ahead. And then the great declaration, my Lord, my God, it really is him. Now, I ask you this because it's the skeptics who propagate this question. If for three and a half years, Jesus went around foretelling of his death and not just his death, but his resurrection, don't you think you'd have to be a little bit hard of hearing to not have heard him say, going to be torn down, some thought he was talking of the temple and then raised up on the third day, that when he actually appeared, Thomas says, I won't believe it. I'm like looking at him, but I won't believe it until I can actually touch you. That doesn't appear to me to be a ghost, a Christophany, a theophany, or any type of theophany, all right? It appears to me as honest reporters chronicling that even, even though the proof was standing right in front of them, doubt still existed. This is what I love. This is why I said if we were, if we were fabricating, we'd never include such a thing. And there were probably many others, including the fact that when we see Mary at the tomb in her confusion, she's even doubting. She thinks the body's been taken. I know not where they've laid my Lord. She's speaking to Jesus and thinking he's a gardener. So you can kind of put all these pieces together and say, if you're recording this, you certainly wouldn't add these dimensions to those people who you're supposedly using as uh, testimony to validate your claim, all right? Next, we have something that I want to touch on, which is there have been theories, and these theories just didn't start 30 or 40 years ago with my late husband. These are theories that go way back of how Jesus wasn't really dead, but in the coolness of the tomb, he resuscitated. And the fact that they brought aloe and myrrh, and man, there's a husband and wife team that came up with a really great theory, which is the aloe and myrrh actually helped bring Jesus back to life. It wasn't used for his burial, that there was enough stuff that was applied and ingested that he, he, he came alive again, right? But he wasn't really dead. So I want to just paint a picture, and excuse me, it's slightly blasphemous, but I want you to kind of get the feel for this. Because if you and I endured what Christ went through, which is he was beaten, I mean, it's a bloody image. We, some of us have watched The Passion of the Christ. It's probably very uh, graphic, and maybe even it was more than that. In fact, there are historians that record how, as I said last week, when people were beaten, and whipped before they were crucified, some would have veins actually protruding and sticking out, or the, their innards would come out because of the depth of what was taken away, the flesh that was carved away that left this disgusting sight. But I want, I want to just paint a picture. We know what Jesus endured, at least what we read, and then he was crucified, and we know basically people who would like to accept the medical understanding that he was not crucified through the hand, as some suggest. The body would never support the weight if Jesus even weighed 180 or 200 pounds, or if you took uh, an 80-pound individual, that hand would rip open. We know factually that the nail, 
the nail went through the wrist and through the feet. So I want, I want to paint this picture. He's been whipped, he's been beaten, he's got nail holes in the, in the, in the wrists and in the feet, a bloody scene. He's been put in the tomb after being on the cross not, not very many hours. And if the theory that he didn't really die, I don't know who really survives a Roman crucifixion. In fact, they wanted to make sure that Jesus said he was dead, so they stabbed him. They didn't break his legs, and then it says water and blood came out of his side. I want to paint the picture that if they put him in the tomb and that aloe and myrrh refreshed his soul because he wasn't really dead, then I want to paint a picture of if you're familiar geographically with where either one of those tombs are, either one, doesn't matter, pick any one, and I want you to imagine that after three days, after the aloe and myrrh finally kicked in, <laughs> here's Jesus. He didn't really die, but he makes his way with the nail holes and the blood and the flesh is kind of hanging off of him, and he makes his way, the trek through the city, to where his disciples are, which would probably have been at least a two-day trip, <laughs> tired, terribly worn out looking, bloody, dirty, knocks on the door and says, anybody home? <laughs> and Peter answers and opens the door and says, wow, Jesus, you look terrible. <laughs> yeah, well, you should have seen what I've been through, right? <laughs> now, I don't mean to be blasphemous, but when people say he didn't really die and he just resuscitated, even if he resuscitated and made his way to where the disciples were, what type of hero of the faith would these people be propagating if a, an emaciated almost death warmed over, whatever that means, corpse, pierced, bloody, appears at your door and says, I'm alive. <laughs> what, what do you do with that? But Jesus is not depicted at all like that. He's depicted as eating and drinking and being with them and appearing to them at many different times during the 40 days as Luke chronicles. So the whole idea that he would have resuscitated falls flat on its face for a number of reasons, but the biggest one is why propagate, why then preach a risen, dead and risen Christ, when in fact you're now beginning your whole story on a lie, which brings me to something that is very interesting that has lots of people polarized. So I'm going to touch on this, but I'm not going to tell you what you should believe. I'm going to say, say go examine the evidence for yourself. But there's one crucial thing about what Jesus said when he kept saying the third day or on the third day, which seems like most of, most of the people, anybody home, are not reading that whether you want to interpret on the third day, after the third day, during the third day, because each one records in their own way and is using their own verbiage, we're not looking at a verbatim uh, moment in time the key thing is that when people say he was crucified on Friday, which is how the Catholic Church has perpetuated Good Friday and Easter Sunday, the problem is that you can never get three days out of Friday to Sunday. You'll never get three days. I don't care if you want to invent a day. You'll never get, or how you're counting, one and a half makes two, especially not in the Jewish tradition, which is how they calculated time. The most important thing is scholars are very polarized on this because they say, well, if the third day is really the third day, or if it's the third day, is it three days and three nights? Is it on the third? Is it after the third day? And they're all losing sight of the most important thing. Jesus said there'll be no other sign except the sign of Jonah. It's the one time where this minor prophet with a major message gets used. And it, he says clearly, there'll be no other sign except the sign of Jonah. And it describes of Jonah. Jonah was in the great fish three days and three nights, and then he was spewed up alive, right? Full of fish stuff, probably. But he went on to preach. Jesus said, there'll be no other sign but that. This is, these are all very important things, because the scholars will get caught up on the minutia of what it means. Is it after the third day? Was it in the third day, in the third hour? But all that's irrelevant. What's relevant is what Jesus said, the essence of his message. Now, this is what I ask you to consider. If we were examining evidence and fabrication, here's the thing that I have real issue with. How do you manipulate? First of all, how do you manipulate your 
the timing of your death, supposedly to coincide with being the Passover offering? How do you manipulate that? How do you make it happen just so? But more importantly, how do you manipulate three days? I mean, you know, whenever you come out of the tomb, you know, when you come out of the tomb, you come out of the tomb, right? I mean, if you're going to come out of the tomb, you come out of the tomb. No, you're not getting me. All right. <laughs> but he said specifically, and whether you want to say after the third day, three days, he said something rather specific. People are hung up on the minutia of what it means. Is it after the third day? Is it on the third day? Is it during the third day? That's irrelevant. What he said, the most key thing, is three days. Whether the three days and three nights fully, as we understand, or in the Judaic way, it doesn't matter. To predict that and come forward at that set time, fulfilling all of the set times of God, would take beyond Houdini. And you can say, well, maybe that's not manipulated, but other things may be. As I described, how do you manipulate a crowd of people on what is Palm Sunday, known to the church as Palm Sunday? How do you manipulate a crowd of people as he says, go get that colt and the, the, the donkey. Go get it, and I'm going to ride in there. How do you manipulate everybody to cry out, Hosanna to the king, Hosanna to the king, as he comes in? How do you start that? Is it, is it Peter's in the corner over here, and you got somebody else in the corner over there, Hosanna, and then they all start chanting it, and you get everybody involved? How do you get everybody involved? You don't. How do you manipulate that many people? How do you manipulate Pilate? How do you manipulate Herod? How do you manipulate the miracle events that occurred? I used the example of... Again, this is during his earthly ministry. How do you manipulate the multitudes who it's recorded that this boy came? Oh boy, here it goes. This boy came and he had a little bit of uh, fish and a little bit of bread, right? And the miracle of feeding the multitudes with that, just that little bit. How do you manipulate the multitudes into everybody's going to receive from that little bit and everybody's going to be full and there's going to be leftovers. How do you manipulate that? Unless it's all made up, of course. But we're assuming that these events are recorded as Owen says, that they actually saw what they saw and they're honestly reporting it. Or did they say to the boy, hey boy, go into Bethsaida or the next town there and here, we got how many pennies worth do we have here? Here, you go to the nearest hamburger joint and Beth said, you buy hamburgers for everybody. It would be like the hamburger decision, but in Jesus' day. Everybody gets a hamburger, right? <laughs> Y'all get hamburgers. And then we'll just say that Jesus performed this great miracle, right? We'll say the master did this thing. Because, you know, he hasn't been doing too many miracles of late. So, I mean, the whole thing is ludicrous. You can't make up stuff like this. Well, you could, I suppose. But how do you make up the thing, for example, of a paralytic being healed or a man who is blind and blind from birth and yet he goes in and sees and then they turn against him because he says, well, this man was blind from birth and now he sees. How is this possible? So when we get to the miracle of the resurrection, I don't know why we're even trying to argue that this event couldn't happen because it makes all of the other things that occurred in Jesus' ministry, you know, if you weigh, weigh out all the different eyewitnesses to events, People say, but he only appeared to his disciples. Well, that's why I said the post-ascension appearances are important. Because if you're, if you're not looking for post-ascension appearances, you say, well, this was all a fabrication, and these guys made it up, and they're going to perpetuate a story. But post-ascension, that means after Jesus has gone up in the sky in the clouds, we have Stephen recording, seeing a vision of Christ, and we'll study this Greek word, on festival, I won't do it here for to see and vision, and it'll clarify a lot because the Greek is very specific, and equally to Paul. And Paul, as I said, is the star witness of the whole program here because Paul, unlike the rest of the people who they all had to keep together to keep telling a lie, to keep perpetuating that Jesus indeed rose from the dead and he's the Messiah and he's the Christ and he's the fulfillment, he was a Jew. He was persecuting Christians. He didn't have any, there was no dog in the fight for him to actually get into this thing called Christianity. And then he says all of a sudden, after his Damascus Road experience, that he had exposure to the risen Christ post-ascension. These things become almost like a mind-boggling, if you start to examine the evidence, and I said, there's so many of them. I don't, again, I'm, I'm, at the, I'm almost at an hour point, and I'm thinking to myself, and I haven't even exhausted the rest of the information. The crucial thing is, 
that people say, well, why should it matter to me? You know, you're, 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 you're laboring this point. Why should it matter to me? Well, here's the deal, which I said last week uh, in, in summary, which is they either all made up a lie or they were telling the truth. And if they were telling the truth and Christ is risen, then the very things that are declared about Christ for those who trust and believe in him become validated by his resurrection and they become true to you and to me, not because I would like to believe that they're real, but because they actually happen. Now, the interesting thing here is that if we are going to try and pick some of this apart even more, I would say to you, and there's, there's much more to pick apart, but we've got, beginning at the first century, we have events and people that begin to formulate church history. I'm going to leave you with this one because I think it's the most important in terms of when people say, but there's no, there's no trail to what happens after these people. Yes, there is. We've got a mention of somebody here, just sounds like a random name, in Timothy. Just kind of a random thing. Second Timothy, fourth chapter. This is the close of the letter of 2 Timothy, beginning at verse 19, salute Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum, sick. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. And Linus, that name Linus, is slightly perplexing. Why? Because if you go to the record, I know you're going to think, wow, this is kind of freaky. A long time ago, when I first got this Bible, which is maybe not that long ago, I began writing in my Bible. It's a list of all the popes from beginning. They, they start, the Catholic Church starts with Peter. But the second bishop of Rome, and technically second pope, but they will call him bishop, is a man named Linus. He lived from 67, or he was, he was I'm sorry, he was pope or bishop from 67 to 76 AD. It is the same Linus as the one recorded in 2 Timothy. And we can go back and start pulling apart that list of greetings to find out that in there, there's a whole host of interesting historical information that we could get into, but I want to stick to, we could talk about things that will take us to Britain and other attachments. But I'm looking at just the name to tell you that Linus, there's not too much said about him. And in their own historical records, I'm speaking of the Catholic Church, they actually list him as the same Linus mentioned in 2 Timothy. I'm not taking their reference as anything that has weight. I went to do my own research, and there is abundant proof to say this individual is, and this begins the line. Now, if this line begins to be perpetuated, the trust and care of the gospel message also begins to be perpetuated. And by the time you get to a man like, who is called in his writings, First Clement, he provides an incredible amount of information, including in his writing, The Fate of Peter and Paul, uh, amongst many other records, letters that are very, very similar in their feel to 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians correctively. And you begin to ask yourself the question, how could this have stayed? How could this have gotten off and stayed and remained essentially intact for this long if it was all based on a fabrication? And something interesting comes out of that. You'll go back far enough in time, it may not be to Linus, but by the time you get to Clement I in Catholic records, by the time you get to Clement I, you've got historical documents that are extant and are not debated. Now that tells me something. If you're going to say, well, I'm still skeptical about this record here that we call the New Testament. Once you go back far enough and you can put your finger on something that the best authenticators, the most, we're talking about the most uh, expert people in expertizing looking at paper, looking at ink, say this is authentic and this is real, recording this type of history and perpetuating this story of Jesus who died for our sins, was buried, rose up, ascended, and is coming back. At some point, 
you're facing some incredible information that forces you to reevaluate if you still haven't made a decision on the verity of all this, could this have happened? And I'm going to come back to say, only looking at a historical method, not subjectively, not I know he lives because he lives within my heart, but when you begin to uncover the amount of, as I said, intrinsic evidence, some of it is shady, why include doubt, why include the brothers that didn't believe and now suddenly the brothers who don't believe become the pillar at Jerusalem. Why all of a sudden all of these small pieces that seem irrelevant build up something that becomes the bedrock of, if somebody's looking, the bedrock of what I would say is the proof beyond a shadow of a doubt that these men were not lying, but they were telling the truth. And if it is indeed the truth, which it is, you and I have an incredible future awaiting us. We have an incredible present in that Christ lives, he lives, he is risen, he lives, he ever liveth to make intercession for us, but we have an incredible future ahead of us, which means for the Christian, a life filled of hope. Hope if we live now, even in misery and sorrow, and in the tumult of living day to day, and hope when we look at that last enemy called death, because death no longer has dominion over the Christian, and future time, because we will be with him, not as floating amorphous masses or cherubims that are wearing some part of a diaper somewhere, but actual bodies that have been given to us, glorified to be with the Lord forever. That's the Christian hope, and that's the reason to present this much information, who knows? I, I didn't even get to the rest of my notes, but I've got so many other avenues to take. I challenge you, especially you who have not really looked at the evidence, to listen to some of the teaching, especially messages presented by my late husband, Dr. Gene Scott, on the resurrection. His points are brilliant. They are solid. And quite frankly, when I first listened, that was one of the first messages I was exposed to and something clicked in my brain that I, although I professed that I knew who God was up until that time, after I heard the message, I realized I don't know who God is. This is the God that I need to get to know because it's the God that is from this book, not from my imagination, not from subjectivity, but from a factual examination of the evidence that does indeed demand a verdict that says he is risen. That is the hope we have as Christians. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www dot pastormelissascott.com